since retirement, I've been on this eight year brain health journey to research what had happened to me. And when I got better, I always thought like my life's journey could be bringing something forward that could help alleviate suffering in both the concussion world and the mental health space in general. Welcome to the My Future Business Show, where we get you in front of your best audience and keep you there. Not only are we interviewing the biggest names in business to help you become even more successful, we're inviting you to book your spot on the show to help you grow your business. So at the end of the call, make sure you fill in the interview application form at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. Hi and welcome back to the My Future Business Show. My name's Rick Nusky. I am your host. I'm also the luckiest person today because I have uh, the opportunity to talk to the wonderful Daniel Carcillo. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Thanks for having me, Rick. Absolutely, my pleasure. Now, just for context, we're going to be talking about uh, your experience uh, winning the coveted NHL Stanley Cup, uh, your 10-year career in that uh, particular industry as a professional sportsman, and we're going to be talking about uh, how you founded and as the CEO of Wasana uh, organization to talk about data-driven life sciences and the journey as pioneers in drug development and therapies for mental health care. Now, that's one hell of a mouthful to get out all in once. I'm glad I got really good lungs. Yeah, buddy. Let's uh, take a deep breath before you start that sentence. Ever. <laughs> well, again, um, you've had a long and illustrious uh, professional career. I'd love to take a bit of a deep dive into that in a while, as well as obviously Wasana and all the amazing things that they're doing with uh, the healthcare and mental health that uh, you're involved with. But uh, before we do any of that, it's uh, usual, us, usual for us, uh, Daniel, to spend some time learning a little bit about you. So uh, where are you calling in from today? Uh, so yeah, I'm based in Florida now. Uh, just moved here recently from from Chicago, and originally from uh, just outside of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Yeah, fantastic. Now, when you were growing up, where was that? Do you recall? Um, yeah, so King City, Ontario. Um, I left home. You know, I've been in America for the most part, um, pretty full time, eight months on uh, since I was uh, 19 when I turned pro. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Now, uh, let's let's talk about that, because I'd love to talk a little bit about um, your hobbies and sports. I know that your professional uh, career has ceased, and we're going to be talking about that. But what do you do nowadays? Do you still keep active? Is, is sports and hobbies important for you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. Uh, it's one of the big reasons we, we moved down to Florida, uh, so that we can be active all year round. I have three young kids under the age of seven, and just Busy trying to dad. keep up to my, uh, yeah, no doubt, trying to keep up to, <laughs> to all three of them, especially my seven-year-old boy, Austin Wolf. And, um, you know, it's fun. We, we go, we're able to enjoy the outdoor rink, um, here. There's two roller rinks right down the street. We've got a nice little skate park, basketball Excellent. court, Excellent. racquetball. He's in soccer, he's in golf. So, uh, we're all really happy that we, the, uh, we made the decision to come down here. Excellent. Now, it's funny how your life transitions away from everything that you want to aspire to achieve to those of you, especially seven-year-olds. They sit, they tend to have this uh, persistence about them, don't they? Oh, big time. Yeah, it uh, takes a lot of energy to keep up with them, especially <laughs> after the, the long work days that we've been putting in, but try to set aside everything for them um, after six o'clock. And um, yeah, it's, it's just nice to watch him grow. And he's been ripping around some electric dirt bikes here. You can't really, you know, ride two strokes. <laughs> the neighborhood we live in, we used to have uh, five acres and a nice little pond and he used to, you know, ride a uh, two stroke four wheeler. But um, yeah, yeah, he's got will. a little, yeah, he's got a little band of bros here. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's pretty great. Everybody's always coming by and knocking on the door and um, yeah, couldn't be happier for, for the home we've uh, been able to create here so far. Well done. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Now, uh, with, uh, I guess, uh, the things that you have done in your life, do you think there, I guess, your discipline is rubbing off on your children? Yeah, I think I, I would hope so. Um, <laughs> you know, I think uh, there's a couple rules when you come in our house and, you know, you close the doors behind you and you take your shoes off and you pick up after yourself. And, um, you know, I think one of the things I try to instill in my kids that can be done uh, in life in general is just attention to detail and anything you do you you do it with purpose and um, yeah so I think that uh, some of the stuff that I've learned through sport uh, and that I continue to do in my daily life is, is starting to rub off so it's nice to see. 
So tell us a little bit about, I guess, your professional um, sporting background. I can see some wonderful cups behind you there. And I know that oh, yeah. you've been involved very, very deeply. And I'm very, very super impressed to have you on the show to talk about this. Could you share a little bit about your journey there? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I moved away from home at, at 15 years old when I made mm -hmm. a decision to, to really take a good swing at it. And in Canada, it's a little bit different, the development path of a young man who's trying to turn pro in hockey. Um, you don't necessarily take the NCAA or college route if you want to fast track pro. You can turn pro right out of high school, which is something yep. that I did. Mm -hmm. um, so I got drafted to a league called the Canadian Hockey League. And uh, in the sixth round and then um, a year and a half later I was drafted to the NHL at 17 turning 18 uh, after moving away from home three hours three hours away and then I uh, found myself you know just continuing to apply myself uh, to everything I did including school and then um, you know before you sign a pro contract you have a decision to make and you give up kind of that university eligibility in Canada mm -hmm. and Thought I was in a good position to do that. Got drafted 73rd overall in the world and just wanted to give it a good shot. And so yeah. graduated high school, signed pro and uh, turned pro at, at 18, turned 19 and, um, you know, spent about a year and a half in the AHL, which is the developmental league, albeit professional. And you're on your own doing your own laundry <laughs> and you grow up pretty quick. Yeah, I bet. And, um, and then, yeah, I spent, you know, my 20 year old to, to 30 year old age um playing in the nhl and, and against you know the best hockey players in the world and was lucky enough to go to the stanley cup finals four times with five different teams winning twice uh fought over 164 times in in the enforcer role and you know was able to you know garner 100 points over my career so uh, i was somebody that uh, tried to do it all but in hockey it's um you know if you if you mess around, there has to be somebody to respond. And yep. um, that's just part of my nature. You can't take advantage of, you know, the loved ones and, and mm -hmm. my, my teammates. And um, and that's something that, you know, certain guys have to step up and, and answer the bell to. And, and that was part of my job. Yeah, fantastic feedback. Thank you very much. Now, I know as a, a young man coming into a high pressure role like that, I know that we talk a bit about, in fact, a lot about doing the things you love to do. Um, now, what was driving you? What was your motivation at the time? I know that you have an aspiration to do it, but how did you, I guess, what was motivation for you at that time? And how was the pressure? Did you deal with it okay? Yeah, I mean, you know, I thought I did throughout, the, throughout my career. And then I think you look back after you deal with certain you know, physical traumas, emotional traumas that mm. maybe didn't sit well with you and you couldn't really recognize at the time. Because once you're in it, especially in that environment, um, you know, any sign of weakness per se. And and back in, in my day when I started in the NHL, this is, you know, pre-Twitter, pre-Instagram, um, when everybody was talking about mental health, uh, it really did feel like um, some sort of weakness if you talked about it. So the way that we would mask it, and I wasn't the only one, is with alcohol and with opiates and muscle yeah. relaxers and pills mm -hmm. and cortisol and um, all of the different things that uh, could help you get through the pain because the reality is we played an 82-game schedule over 185 days wow. and um, a lot of travel and um, you're always constantly in pain. It's funny when you go to training camp, that's when your body starts breaking down. So that ended up manifesting, you know, I went through some pretty, pretty rough, a pretty rough period. Um, when I, when I moved away from home from like 16 to 17 during my draft year. And, um, that really turned me into this kind of alter altered person, if you will, or alter ego yeah. that you know, I think you see manifest on the ice, which is my nickname was car bomb. And, um, again, I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, uh, extremely unpredictable, you know, and, but it was also a weapon you know, that I knew that that teams liked and that guys liked, to be honest, because I didn't play a full scale skill game. I could play on the first line. But um, again, if anybody tried to mess around with guys that they didn't know uh, or that they knew couldn't fight, well, I'd be coming over the boards next. And I was the type of guy that if you were bigger than me, um, I would probably lead with my stick you know, to try and win you and get the advantage. Yeah. And then I would follow that with my fists, you know? And so um, I think it just kept a lot of people in check. And, uh, but looking back on it now, um, you know, I could see that there was, there was uh, maybe a little boy in there that was that was crying out for help, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm loving this story so far. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what's a daily routine look like for you? Did you take a bit of the discipline away from those uh, rigorous training days into your life today? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I said, you know, I think, I think that, um, hockey players don't really realize how special we are because when mm. we, when we leave the game and this was my situation, I, I felt completely broken. Um, and then because of the symptoms that were, were uh, froth in my life because of the traumatic brain injuries and hits to the head and the body that I sustain, yeah. uh, I had a, a hard time, like just managing simple tasks, you know? And so, um, I really had to, you know, dive in and, and do the research as to why this was going on. Um, but I think being diligent, number one, uh, having a, a really hard work ethic, like that's one thing that my, my parents instilled in me from an early age and hardworking Italian people. And, um, is just, you work harder, you outwork your competition. And every day I try to wake up and I do that. I try to out entrepreneur them, if you will, <laughs> and just outthink them, you know, and, um, because hockey, uh, there's, you know, 10 guys on the ice moving at 35 miles an hour. And then you got to put a little rubber puck to spaces where people are going to be not mm -hmm. where they are. And then you got to beat a goalie. And then you're doing this when there's no out of bounds, there's nowhere to go, uh, unless you're going to make a change and you got to protect yourself at all times, not get your head taken off. Uh, you have a lot of foresight into understanding and just thinking and problem solving really, really fast. And so, um, that's what I think entrepreneurship is. And that's why I think, you know, some athletes are able to manage a lot of spinning plates and, uh, I'm grateful for that lesson and the attention to detail, especially because that really lends itself to the life science business in Wisana that I'm doing now. And there's just a lot of things to manage. Um, and then people, right? People is, is sometimes the, the biggest currency. And I know how to, um, get along with Swedish people, Finnish people, Russian people, Slovenian yes. people, Canadian people, Very uh, US people. Yeah. I just met so many different people in my life. So yeah, extremely, extremely grateful. And I've taken a lot of, of skills from hockey and from my professional, uh, former professional career and applied them here to, to entrepreneurship. And we saw them most definitely. So we're going to pivot away from that for a moment. Cause I always love to get a bit of, I uh, get a, I guess your personal life. What sort of music do you like listening to? Oh yeah, man. Well, I got, you know, Led Zeppelin here. Yeah, uh, no, I saw that and I thought I have to ask you, where did you get yeah, that? Yeah, buddy. I'm looking at uh, a bunch of records. Well, I've always wanted it. I've always wanted that particular photo and my wife surprised Fantastic. me. Uh, yeah, thank you for my 37th birthday. And I'm a simple man with simple pleasures. I like my <laughs> vinyl and I like my classic rock. And um, yeah, I love me, my Led Zeppelin for sure. There's just something warm and inviting about a vinyl, isn't there? Over digitized wow. music. You can't compare it, best. can you? No, it's, yeah, it's the best. I've got, uh, you know, over to the left, I've got a, a Gretsch and uh, a bass guitar signed by um, by Rush and uh, a few other acoustics. And then I, I stare at, at vinyl every day. I've got yeah. to go my collection. I've got about three or 4,000. Um, I used to do a, a radio show at WGN in Chicago. so. <laughs> uh, kind of had my pick of the litter, but yeah, there's nothing like you know, putting on vinyl and sitting back and not yeah. being able to essentially press next, you know? Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for, for sharing this. Just this window, I think is what makes the, my future business show so different, so special, because we actually talk a little bit about you as well as business, which you're obviously going to do a lot more about in a moment. Now, um, when you, uh, were playing hockey, it was very, I guess aggressive, call it what you will, very power oriented. How do you find yourself today? Do you find that you are generally more calm and relaxed and happy to be you in, in the place you are right now? Yeah, I mean, I've always been like a generally calm guy, pretty easy going off the ice. When people meet me, they're like, wow, you're, you know, you're really nice and low key. And um, we didn't think that of you because the way you play the game. <laughs> Um, so I've always sort of been this way. I haven't had this like close relationship with myself that I have now, which this medicine has allowed me to create, mm -hmm. um, to your point, I really do love myself and, and I can then love others, um, more deeply, you know, my wife, my kids, my family, yeah. my friends. Um, so it's been, um, it's been a nice change over the last call it, you know, three years, four years of really being on this brain health journey and, and rediscovering, you know, who I am and, and my worth and all that matters is, um, you know, how I view 
myself, right? We, you know, I say this a lot. Um, we all go to bed essentially alone, right? Whether we're married or not, and whether our kids are in the bed, we go to bed alone with our thoughts. And I think that we have to, you know, recognize and be comfortable with who we are. And then you're comfortable in any situation. And, um, and that really spills out, you know, into everything you do, work, relationships, fun, uh, hobbies, uh, whatever may have you. So yeah, yeah fantastic. Um, pretty happy right now for sure. Excellent. Excellent. Now I know that uh, we all um, have um, people around us as we're growing up and you would have had several, I would have thought that um, played somewhat of a mentor role, coaching roles for you. How important were they? And um, can you recall um, what difference they've made to you, not only in your professional hockey life, but now in business? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the foundation of who I am and my experiences as a young man come from the household I grew up in and my parents, and my two brothers, um, mm -hmm. Paul and Steve, and um, were just, you know, really amazing people and, and showed me um, a way to create a foundation of how you're supposed to treat people. Um, say please, you say thank you, and, and you're grateful for what you have and even the little things that you have. You know, I'm not the type of guy that um, takes pleasure or gains his happiness from, you know, necessarily purchasing things. Um, and so I appreciate that. And then I had a really influential coach growing up in double A um, in Rob Gibb, who I'll never forget and just mm -hmm. instilled that type of work ethic and really confidence because my parents weren't overly um, communicative in that manner. Um, and he was. You know, he saw something in me early on. I had a teacher named Miss McCammon who saw the same thing, who I'll never forget. I think she was my grade grade two or grade three, three teacher. Um, and when you remember somebody like that so young, um, you don't quite remember all of the lessons, but no. the feelings, you know? Yep, yep. And, um, and then I would say my professional career, well, growing up, um, you know, Coach Gilbert was really great to me in, in Mississauga and in junior. And then... Um, I had Steve Monador who came into my life at 25. Uh, when I was in Chicago, I was newly sober and he was seven years into living a happy and fulfilling life. And he just took me under his wing and showed me that I could do that too. And, um, you know, I'll never forget, you know, I wish that he was still here with us. Yeah. Um, he was a big catalyst for me retiring and and also, um, you know, starting WeSANA and making sure that we need to support people that have had uh, numerous traumatic brain injuries. And um, so, yeah, those are the ones that are definitely front of mind right now, for sure. So the student becomes the master ultimately as time goes by. Do you find yourself, uh, has your role changed and are others looking to you now? I don't know. Um, maybe, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, to the right of me and to the left of me over my left shoulder and right shoulder are books, you know, and yep. um, I read a lot and I try to gain knowledge every single day and try to better myself uh, when when time permits. And um, I'm I'm hoping that I can emulate something that people want to be. Um, that's not the purpose of the reason I live my life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, I was in a really, really dark place and this medicine helped me along with all of the skills that I acquired and, and the diligent efforts that I've made um, to invest in myself, not only money, but some of the most precious things on this earth or the most, which is time, yep. um, you know, that really helps to change, you know, who you are and, and you know, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the type of person that I don't like, I'll describe myself to you in this interview this week, and hopefully I'll be different next, you next know? Week, yeah. Yeah. I just want to keep, keep growing and gaining knowledge and, um, be a symbol of hope that you can get extremely dark. And I think yeah. a lot of my followers know how dark it got. And then now you can get better. You can definitely get better and be the best version of yourself for sure. You have the option to make a choice, don't you? Now, um, you seem like you're in a very good place now. Can we talk momentarily a little bit about, I guess, your first entrepreneurial journey? You know, your yeah. first entrepreneurial experience. Yeah, for sure. Um, definitely on a big level, like managing people. You know, I had some, I started out with like a, a studio rank and owning that and doing something. And what I thought I could only do, right, is like teach hockey and teach what I know. And then I moved out of that um, and, you know, founded WeSANA 
from a personal journey. Since retirement, I've been on this eight year brain health journey to research what had happened to me and, and then how I can get better. And that brought me across, you know, advanced diagnostics and functional neurology, the best neurologists in the world and um, the best doctors in the world and some holistic tools like float tanks and hyperbaric chamber and changing your diet and optimizing your sleep and natural remedies, unnatural remedies, pharmaceuticals, you name it. Wow. Um, and then I found, you know, something that really accelerated my healing uh, when done with intention and and a lot of, um, you know, I, I call it being coachable um, and direction and taking direction. And then number one, asking for help when I knew that um, I was close to, to being hopeless and, and pretty suicidal. You know, that's when my life started to really turn around when I surrendered. Um, and when I got better, uh, I always thought like my life's journey could be, um, you know, bringing something forward that could help alleviate suffering in both the concussion world and just the mental health space in general, because there's just not enough. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I definitely am the type of person that I don't speak about it unless I do it. Mm. And I have to speak about it through my experience. And then hopefully if you like what you hear or see, you'll go try it yourself. But I encourage you to do your own research. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, luckily I found this recovery with the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, which is psilocybin. And I was able to, you know, get healthy enough over a six month period and, and do tests on myself, on my brain and my blood to prove that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then grateful to have some people come into my life who are drug developers that are helping me move through the FDA process to create what could be the first FDA approved pharmaceutical for traumatic brain injury that you know has little to no abuse liability and and little to no side effects that i think could be an absolute game changer for people that are suffering yeah very exciting and you know i think the the world in general and at large are changing their views on what you know things that may have i guess historically be seen as you know illicit drugs and you know for hippies if you like and but now it's not like that is it no, I mean, you know, I think you just have to step back and ask yourself, right? We get inundated with these messages every day. And um, why is it that some of the Schedule One substances include cannabis that grows in most ditches in most states mm. naturally and, and that we've obviously evolved with because we have an endocannabinoid system in our body that gets activated by taking these cannabinoids? And then, um, you know, these magic mushrooms that, you know, let you access parts of your brain that aren't communicating properly and have this neuroplastic um, effect and allow you to better problem solve and have better access to language, etc. And it's really a locking key to serotonin. So it's something that I believe we've evolved with as well. And these two compounds are scheduled, um, you know, so... It just makes it harder to research, but nonetheless, I think we're all reverting back to uh, something that not necessarily has failed everyone, but uh, have put some people, you know, it just hasn't worked for, for 30 to 40% of the population that try antidepressants and SSRIs and these inhibitors. So mm. I think there's a different way, a new way, but you have to, you know, research that and be really diligent and, and with scientific rigor, bring it through the most rigorous process on earth, which is the FDA, um, and develop something that could be prescribed by a doctor so you know exactly what you're going to get and people can have access to it and then insurance companies can reimburse people for it. So you're not paying out of your pocket for cash and wondering what you're getting from, you know, possibly the guy on the corner on or the, corner, the guy yeah. on your street, you know? <clears throat> so, um, yeah, just, um, you know, I think there's a lot of factors of, of why it's so stigmatized, um, but that's also why we're hopeful through our work and, and the work of, you know, people like Mike Tyson and Juliana Pena um, that we can show through the athletic platform that, you know, speaking about mental health, number one, doesn't have to be stigmatized and, and these psychedelics can um, definitely have a really positive impact on your life. You talk about Mike Tyson and, you know, you've got other investors in this early stage startup. Now, tell us a little bit about, I guess, some of the caliber here, because I think that's quite important. If these people who are, you know, they're very well known, you know, if they're on board, what does that say about the industry, the, the potential? 
do you think? Yeah, I think the potential is pretty clear. Um, the early data and the fact that psilocybin specifically has been designated FDA breakthrough designation for two different companies and mm. you know, the largest uh, human trial in a 2B trial has shown decent um, efficacy and safety uh, for treatment resistant depression. Um, I think we're all there now. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, really shepherding this along the right way. But to get Mike's endorsement, because we are working with, you know, traumatic brain injury related symptoms mm. uh, is something that was really important for us early on and continues to be. Um, you know, we've had some great support uh, from, you know, K2 and Adrian Moranti and, and Cody Chandra, and Michael Sobeck and Aaron Robb from Ambria Capital and, you know, JLS Fund and um, ITER. And uh, there's been a lot of people uh, like Andy DeFrancesco and Soul Global that have really supported us early on. And um, we're at a stage now where we've been executing so well. Uh, we just communicated with the FDA in our pre-IND meeting and you know we've got a really defined pathway forward to uh, what could be you know regulatory approval and the first of its kind for something that could also be self-administered and live on your counter that is non-hallucinogenic or sub-perceptual mm. so i think that's a game changer and that differentiates we from everybody else and um, it always goes back to the team you know um, this mission got started from my personal story but you know, we have people like my CSO, Mark Wingertson, who's been able to, with his team, Jeffrey and Stacy, put this into a model that the FDA accepts, and that's tremendous. And um, so I'm grateful for, for everybody that's really pulling the rope in the right direction. Yeah, I've just noticed, I mean, how long has this been going for now, the We Sign a Startup? Uh, just about a year and a half, a little mm. bit over a year yep. and a half. Yeah, Time so flies, well, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, we've been able to do a lot in, in a short period of time and we'll continue to and we like to run a lean ship mm -hmm. and, um, you know, no drama and, and just head down um, high done. metabolic rate of work. Yeah. And, and get it done for the people that that need this and, and we need this to come to market as quickly as possible because our reality, too, is, you know, men my age and, and TBI suffers you know, specifically the number one cause of death is suicide. So um, I think that if you can have something that doesn't exasperate the suicidality of dealing with some of these mental health complications, it could be extremely meaningful. So we, we should shepherd it along as diligently and, and quickly as possible. Absolutely. You can just see the potential for the various injuries, you know, um, vehicle related um, traumatic injuries and, you know, the list would go on and on and on. Now, earlier you, you touched on, I guess, the importance of your team. You clearly know exactly what you're talking about just by the way we've spoken today. And I really appreciate you opening up. But could you tell us a little bit about the professionals that are around you that form your team? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'll start with uh, Mark Wingertson, our, our CSO. It's just been a phenomenal, um, a phenomenal person to work with, and mm. I've gotten to know him and, and built a really strong friendship with him and his son Tyler and yep. his whole family. And uh, Jeffrey Jewell and, and Stacy Abbey, who who came on and really supported Mark. And and I mean, these are people that left uh, their big pharma jobs with with companies like GSK to come and, and help this mission and they didn't have to, um, but I think they saw the potential in it and I'm indebted to them to getting to this point. And uh, we just have, yeah, a really great working relationship and I feel grateful that he came into my life. Um, and, you know, along this way, we've been able to uh, purchase clinics as well. Um, so Abid Nazir and uh, Magna Gadar, CMO and Chief Medical Officer and Abit have worked diligently to, to get our clinics to capacity and are serving people now, boots on the ground, helping people with depression, bipolar, addiction. Uh, so that's really meaningful. And we have two clinics operating in Illinois and then a third that's opening now, uh, which will be you know, our largest facility to date at 3,000 square feet, serving FDA approved ketamine, mm -hmm. uh, TMS, advanced diagnostics, um, as well as, you know, that community aspect of, of group therapy and DBT. So we're really proud of that. And then early people like um, Chad Bronstein and Aristotle Loomis and that really helped me 
you know, I think uh, dig out um, who I am and and the person that could be as far as an entrepreneur and really helped shape me into somebody that I can be proud of and and helped really helped me with like the execution part of, you know, mm. sitting in front of a computer and, and showed me <laughs> how to get it done, you yeah. know, and really made, opened up their whole uh, Rolodex, you know, and trusted me with that. So, you know, thank you to them and lots of love for everybody um, from our, you know, team to investors, really. It's, um, it's been a really amazing um, year and a half and I'm just excited for, for this year, you know, to to get hopefully into a investigational new drug application with the FDA uh, is um, is a really big accomplishment in a short amount of time, and and there's more work to be done, and um, just excited to to continue hitting these milestones. Yeah, fantastic. You've touched a little bit about uh, you know your projections and what what's going to happen in the business now from an investor's perspective. I'm wondering um, if I, if that were me, what what are you doing in I guess the next six months to um, you know get more traction? Yeah, so um, constantly you know serving patients uh, mm -hmm. in Illinois and at capacity and long wait lists. So you know we had to go and and build a new facility and that'll be mm -hmm. open May one, which we're really excited about. So you, everybody will hear more there and and then the drug development side to the business is is really where um, you know we have an opportunity to continue to shepherd along um, this novel you know method of use and protocol. Mm -hmm. Uh, to help millions and millions of people so um, you know we're looking at you know a TAM of about six million people every year um, and TBI related MDD the broader MDD major depressive disorder population is over 284 million people Wow! and um, we communicated with the FDA in our pre IND meeting the last year we've really been focused on um you know one thing that you have to do with them is gather information right and not just anecdotal stories and no. QEDs and blood work you have to put what worked for me and what i've seen work for hundreds of thousands of others um not seen but read and and tens of thousands for sure yeah. um have uh you you just have to put it into an fda validated model right yeah. with a yeah. third party independent lab um, and we did that and we showed really good efficacy with the synthetics that we're using because you have to use that. You have to be within a 0.1% variance when you want to develop medicine for millions of people. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we put that into a deck and we communicate that to investors and you, can, you raise the money to continue on this path. Um, we've had a lot of people lucky enough to support us. And then we got this to a position where we, we were ready to make this presentation. We made the presentation to the FDA. We had a pre IND meeting and a written response, which is a really good sign. Yep. And they communicated some, some really great things about our program and they accepted, you know, 505 to B pathway for CBD. And, um, they understood the need. Um, for, you know, getting this medicine into a broader population in an accelerated manner. And we'll be able to speak about that some more uh, yep. here in the near future. And uh, yeah, we're just on a really uh, defined pathway forward. And, and one of the very few companies that has taken the time to be diligent enough and do the research and collect the data necessary to be able to have positive feedback and then uh, well on our way to finish what's called the farm uh, talks program. Um, so you essentially continue on with some animal work before you get the red, uh, excuse me, green light to look into human uh, for an IND opening study with the FDA, uh, which will happen, uh, it is on track for Q4 of this year. So um, all of that being said, you know, I'm happy to, you know, um, be on this path and, and have accomplished what we've accomplished thus far. But like I said, you know, I'm, uh, here's the hockey player brain. Uh, you um, wake up every day and you want to do better um, and you want to do more. And, and um, there's still lots of work to do, but we're really excited about the potential. Yes, thank you so very much for uh, providing some insights. There's going to be a lot of people on this call very excited to see what's happening at, with Sana Health. Now, uh, very importantly, now people are going to want to find out more if they do want to do that. Where are they actually going to go to connect with you? 
Yeah, so they can go to um, www.wesanahealth.com. We just recently uh, got our new website up and running. So Beautiful. shout out to Magna and Alex and Efren and, and the whole marketing team. Um, and we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn. I'm personally on uh, Instagram at Daniel Carcillo 13, um, Daniel Carcillo on LinkedIn. Um, and you can find out more um, about, you know, the program and, and our timelines and exactly what we're using. Because, um, as I said, you know, our company is really differentiated in the way that we use a high dose of psilocybin, uh, which will be done with supervision in a clinic. Uh, but we also have a continuum of care, something that is an add on to uh, what we call an onloading dose that basically wakes the brain up and initiates the serotonin system and, and then continues on with a chronicity of therapy that is a microdose or a subperceptual non-hallucinogenic self-administered mm -hmm. dose at home of psilocybin in combination with the only patented neuroprotectant on earth, which is CBD. So yeah, um, yep. yeah. There, this is a very ex exciting topic and I wish you all the very best. Now, if you're on the call today and you're interested in this, you think there's uh, a good fit for you, uh, either as an investor or somebody who's just interested in this for your personal uh, mental health or whatever it may be, reach out to the team uh, with Daniel. And uh, I'm looking at your team on the website now, which is a beautiful looking website, my I say, at Wasana yeah. Health, which is W-E-S-A-N-A health.com. I'll be making sure that that link is available, available to you below this this post no matter where you see this call you'll see that link and with all that daniel thank you so very much for joining me on the my future business show today yeah brother thanks for having me man thanks for joining us today if you enjoyed the call then make sure to subscribe leave a comment share us with your friends and book your spot on the show at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews and if you're looking for solutions that will help grow your business, then visit myfuturebusiness.com forward slash shop.